So um, hi, I'm Chris. I am the chair of the California Oak Mortality Task Force. And thanks for joining us today for our um, task force executive committee meeting. Um, the task force executive committee tries to meet every year, sometimes more than once a year. And we typically do make it a meeting that's open to the whole membership of the task force. And the membership of the task force is whoever is interested in the work that the task force does with sudden oak death, with um, other challenges to California oaks, including other phytophthoras and um, random other assorted uh, problems and pests related to oaks. Um, today, what we'll have is um, a set of people who sit on the executive committee and um, will give us some updates on work that their various uh, parts of the committee and, and um, people related to it are doing related to sudden oak death and other phytophthoras. Um, if you have questions for them, uh, these updates will go by fairly quickly. I anticipate that some people will have some visuals to share and other people will probably just narrate for us. Um, and if you have questions, please put them in the chat and either we'll be able to um, tackle them as we go along in the flow of the updates and conversation, or we'll try to get to them at the end of the presentations. If you have any other questions for um, me or Janice or Bonnie, um, you can direct them to us individually or put them in the chat. Um, before we get started with our first update, I just wanted to thank three people. First um, of all, Susan Frankel, who um, brought up the point that we it was time for us to have a, an executive committee meeting this year and who largely organized the agenda of speakers. Um, and I want to thank Janice Alexander and Bonnie Nielsen from UC Cooperative Extension for coordinating the meeting and for technical production um, as always. And with that, um, we'll get started with our first update. The first update is about stream monitoring of Phytophthora morum in California, which is something that's coordinated by the Dave Rizzo lab at UC Davis. And um, the people in that lab are extremely busy. So our monitoring committee co-chair, Kim Corella, is going to give that update for the Rizzo lab. So Kim, anytime you are ready to update us, take it away. Okay, I'm gonna just share my screen real quick so you guys can see the visuals. Um, let's see. Are you guys seeing the presentation or is it the wrong screen? We can see it. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, as Chris mentioned, I'm gonna be giving the stream update for the Rizzo Lab. So um, let's see. So um, as in previous years, um, the waterways were baited for five times between March and June. Um, this year, 50 streams are monitored across Northern and Central Coast California um, from collaborators from multiple institutions. This is a slight increase in sampling sites from last year due to fewer COVID restrictions. Um, and the streams last year in the Uruk tribal lands were not monitored due to COVID-19. Um, and previously monitored sites were retained in 2021, particularly to, um, to maximize the detection of pyramorum spread in the high risk and high value forests in the, in the boundaries of uh, Northern Humboldt County and throughout Del Norte County. So I'll start with Del Norte County. Um, 16 sites were sampled this year with up from 11 from uh, what were sampled in 2019 and 2020. Uh, previously, there were uh, the presence of Pier Morum from a single sample from the main stem of the Smith River in 2012. So that river was intensely sampled and surveyed in 2013. And in 2018, um, Pier Morum was isolated in May from the Smith River. Um, those are monitored again in 2019 and 2020, and there was negative. And again, the Smith River was negative for this year. So there's no new positives for Del Norte County. In Humboldt County, uh, monitoring sites increased from 28 to 37 due to the lifting of the COVID restrictions. Um, Peter Morum was not detected from any streams east or north of the Redwood Creek watershed. Uh, in April of um, this year, uh, Mill and Widow White Creek were tested positive for Peter Morum. Those are near 
McKinleyville. They were negative last year. Also, Yeager Creek tested positive again for Piramorum, and that was positive in 2019 and 2020. And the Stanley Creek, which is monitored by the Matul Restoration Council, um, was positive again this year, and it was positive last year. And then the last, the Monterey and San Luis Obispo counties, uh, five sites were monitored this year. There are no positive detections in 2020. Um, previously, San Coprofor Creek, which is the northernmost creek in San Luis Obispo County, was tested uh, positive four times before. Salmon Creek was also positive. That is the southernmost creek in Monterey County in 2018, 19, and 20. And in 2019, we had three new streams test positive that were in the middle of the county, Santa Rita Creek, Santa Rosa, and San Simeon. Um, this year, I had my students and myself um, intensively monitor and sample Santa Rosa, and, uh, or sorry, Santa Rita Creek and San Simeon Creek. They were surveyed and collected over 200 samples, um, and those were all negative for pure morm. We're just trying to find the source of those positive locations. Um, so slow and it's still negative um, for for um, for some of death right now this year. And Cole did say that they were um, not detecting pure morm in sites that were positive last, last year, and he was thinking that lava drought is having effects on that. So that's all I have to present from uh, the Rizzo Lab. Thanks, Kim. Um, just uh, to give one little bit of context for the stream sites that you mentioned near McKinleyville and Humboldt County, Mill Creek and Widow White Creek, um, those are streams that have very little, um, if any, uh, of the host material that we think of as um, being sporulating hosts for P. remorum, um, bay laurel and tan oak are almost undetectable through those kind of semi-urban streams, and um, it continues to show up year after year. So it's kind of interesting. There are some years it's skipped, but draw your own conclusions as you will from that. Um, and um, think about your questions, um, and we'll address them um, after everyone gets through their updates. And so now we'll move on to um, the Forest Pathology and Mycology Lab at UC Berkeley, um, where Matteo Garbalato will give us an update on the sod blitz. Thanks, Matteo. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> and, um, you know, can I take questions? I mean, I have three jobs, and I don't know that I can stay on yep, very absolutely. long. We'll make that so happen. Maybe, so if you can make that happen, I would really appreciate it. So um, this is very interesting because our results are a little bit different from uh, the stream monitoring, which makes me wonder. And, and of course, we're working on the ground with plant samples. So it makes me wonder why why these differences. And maybe maybe with the, with the drought, there's less sporulation going on. And so the rivers are not really getting infested. Um, we have a paper that we published a few years ago that shows the rivers kind of need to be infested every year. So without sporulation. Um, so basically, we, we're working on, on leaf samples. So all of the results you will see are from uh, Tanook and bay leaves. And then for, for San Francisco, we have a, var a variety of ornamental hosts as well. And the purpose of the sub blitz is to, the, the, sub blitz, the, the program sub blitz is a citizen science program, is to identify where Phytophthora remorum is in California across the entire state, and also in what lineage is um, every single uh, sample that we collect. So it's a, it's a pretty big job. This is also the largest uh, citizen science program in the world. Um, so we're very proud of Californians that have been so uh, loyal and keep coming back. And I wanted to thank Doug Schmidt, who has been instrumental in driving this program. That's his picture there. He is the one that has made this happen, including this presentation. And so just look at the red arrows. This is how the results will be published on the web uh, fairly soon once we're done. So almost 15,000 trees were surveyed. Uh, 2, almost 2,100 trees were sampled. Um, 
out of these trees, about 10% were positive for Phytophthora remorum. Uh, but if we include, you know, but what, what's the actual infection rate? Uh, because we are, we are uh, preferentially, actually exclusively selecting trees that are symptomatic, that 10% cannot be the actual rate of infection. So we, can, we actually correct. Uh, and I, I don't have the time to explain to you how we do it, but the actual statewide infection rate is 3.3%. And uh, um, we have several places where we didn't find uh, remorum this year, suggesting that yes, the drought has, has affected the, um, the, the incidence of the disease, but we have two, two areas. Um, the East Bay, um, especially west of the Oakland Hills has a really high infection rate and also Sonoma East, which really is kind of central Sonoma. It's all of the areas around the Sonoma mountain that has a pre-astronomical infection rate, which again makes, makes us wonder a little bit. Uh, we had 2056 collectors, collectors that collected material at about 400 participants to the sub -blitzes. Why is there a difference in numbers? Because a collector usually is a family. So normally a couple is actually counted as one, but usually it's two. Sometimes we have families, actually very often we have families. And so what I wanted to show you here is actually the data for the entire state, which we think are actually comparable. So and why, why we did the sampling is haphazard. So every year people go wherever they want and that's the success of the, what is probably the oldest also citizen science program on an infectious tree disease still ongoing. Um, and uh, um, the, in 2021, we had almost 15,000 trees sampled, uh, surveyed, sorry. We had 2,067 uh, uh, trees sampled. The infection rate was 10.2%. And the estimate tree infection rate was 3.3%. Uh, it's a very low value, and but it's not um, unmatched. So we had a very com very comparable values in 2018, which was a dry year after the very very wet 2017. So what is data are telling us? You can look at the data by yourself here on on this table. Is that the bromorum really has on, on on the transmissive hosts, tanox and bay laurels really has a very cyclical pattern, and I'll show you some data about that. So um, rather than looking at the table, I thought I would show you some maps. So these are the Google Earth maps that we normally publish. This is the Sod Blitz map, which really focuses mostly on the results of each year. So each year is, is presented separately. Later on in the year, we actually um, upload the data in the Sod map, which has every single year together. Um, so these are our results. I mean, the, the, these are highlights. I mean, it takes it would take me, take me hours to actually discuss all of the results, but San Luis Obispo negative, yay. I'm sure the Kim is like, yeah. Um, but it's interesting that differently from the stream results, we had a very large number of positive trees. I mean, many, I think over 15 in uh, the Salmon Creek Canyon, which is right at the border. So here are, there's differences, but th this is based on leaf material and probably it's not sporulated that much because it, it hasn't been raining. We go up from big, so here in, in the picture on the left, you can see all of San Luis Obispo is green. And this is incredible to me that it's still green, but I'm very happy about it. Uh, right at the border, you can see the red trees. Those are, I think, and Kim could correct me. I think that's Salmon Creek. She could correct me later on. Uh, we go up to Big Sur proper up north, very high disease incidence. Carmel Valley, um, we really have a pretty high disease incidence in the Santa Lucia mountains as they come down all the way to the valley. But as we, we, we sample north of the valley and you will see a tree, a green tree kind of north there, even north of Monterey, everything north of the valley came out negative. This has been very consistent through, through, through the years. The Santa Cruz mountains, very highly infested with new outbreaks on the Western slopes. Uh, the Western slopes towards um, the San Mateo coastline, we have several new sites. With, with infection. And we also keep having this very rare but positive infection near <laughs> Big Basin, not Bog Basin, sorry about that. Um, the peninsula, so basically the, when I say peninsula, I mean the, the more urban areas on the Eastern side of the Santa Cruz mountains in Santa Clara and San Mateo County mostly. Um, it's, still, it's still infested, although the infection went down and um, Filoli is a new entry, and I didn't want to show you the picture, but it's, um, it's pretty much a disaster around Filoli, which we expected. So there's a lot of infection in the Filoli area, which is consistent with what we know from the San Francisco PUC um, uh, land. 
This is super interesting. The North Peninsula, uh, Burlingame Hills, San Francisco and Angel Island, very intensively sampled, all of them, all negatives. And uh, I don't understand why Burlingame Hills was negative, but in San Francisco and Angel Island either, but there's been a lot of management of, um, effort here. So maybe, maybe make some, uh, maybe management makes a difference. Remember that when I talk about San Francisco, we also include the Golden Gate Park Nursery, which has been positive until 2019. Last year it was negative and this year is negative. And they're using uh, the recommendation of the COMTF uh, and they're using the recommendations of the fighter group or the Cal fighter group. So obviously those recommendations are working and I'm very happy with it. The Southern part of the East Bay, uh, I think it's uh, this is uh, the Sunol area where this SFPUC manages land around the watersheds. Um, all the samples were negative, which is good. Uh, so we're happy about that. Um, let's move up to Northern California. Both sides of the Oakland Hills, very high incidence all the way up to John Muir National Monument. But it, as we move in, in the interior, all the samples were negative. So Dublin, the Dublin area, Mount Diablo, and even Napa. Uh, but only Southern Napa. So the area uh, around Napa really was, was sample. All those were, were negative. Marine, as usual, a lot of positive. The usual suspects were positive. Dominican was positive. That's important. We're monitoring those trees. So it's actually a good, a good thing for us. But there were some interesting things. Um, Stinson Beach and the Olima Valley. So I don't know if you're familiar with, and I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but um, the whole western side and around the, you know, the, where the San Andreas Fault is, there were a lot of positives. Um, and that's, that's not unheard of. I mean, we knew about it, but it's, it's interesting. Um, Sonoma, uh, western Nevada, interestingly, there's an old area that was sampled and it was all negative. I don't understand why, but it was. So that's a good thing. Sonoma had a high incidence all around the county, but the area around the Sonoma Mountain was particularly high. Um, Southern Mendocino, and there were tribal lands too that we, 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 uh, we surveyed that were positive. We're not going to talk about those specifically. Southern Mendocino, I think there's two nat natural preserves that we surveyed. Both of them were very highly infested. But as we move north, both in the Ukiah and in the Mendocino coastal area, all of the samples were, were negative. Again, this is a baffling situation for us because we know that Ramorum is there, but um, some years we find it on a few trees, some years we don't. So it's definitely not established in the central part of the county, while it is established north of, north of Fort Bragg. Uh, tribal land in Humboldt, in the interior of Humboldt, they were all negative, and it was actually very intensively sampled this year for the first time. And then uh, the Nordy, this, um, some interesting findings that I wanted to share with you. So that's the original EU1 lineage finding. That's where the arrow is. And uh, the larger red trees are positive findings from the ooh, are positive findings from this year. The problem with this picture here is that we're not really truly sure about the locations of the samples. So we will talk to Yana, maybe Yana can talk if she's online. But anyway, so these two samples were taken north and south of that original sample, and they came out strongly positive. So we don't know whether it's E1 or any one. Uh, we haven't done that yet. Uh, but the distance between the two samples as they are now, even if we, we are unsure about the location of the southern one, because it's in the middle of nowhere, uh, it was about 2,600 meters. So about a mile and a half. So that's, uh, that could be potentially significant. And again, this is different from the street results. And these are strong positives. Um, so conclusions, citizen science in the time of cholera, it's a huge success. I mean, this is the second year where we have unprecedented participation in the program. And this year we have the largest number of trees, I think the largest number ever sampled, but I had to put five years because I didn't have time to go and look at the years before. And lineage analysis, so whether the samples are NA1 or E1 or NA2 is still ongoing. So we're not going to talk about that because we actually have no data. But I wanted to end with two snapshots. One on the left-hand side is something that if you haven't read, read, read this paper, if you haven't read this paper, you should. It's a very interesting paper about what Ramorum can do to plants other than oaks. Um, and the two lines that you see in the graph is how, how, how much Ramorum there is versus how much rainfall there is. 
And you can see that the two really have a very synchronous, especially in, in, the, in the later years, the two go hand in hand, which tells us that the more rain there is, the more Ramoro there is. So it makes sense that this year we had a very overall, we had 3%, uh, 3. Uh, whatever, 3.3% infection rate, which is the lowest, but it's not lower than what we experienced in 2018, which was another dry year. But then on the other, um, on the other side of the slide, I have another snapshot. This is a, a kind of not a very easy paper to read, but this is a paper uh, that, that presents results based on large numbers. And we're talking 25,000 data points of, of Ramoron being present or being absent. And what it's showing here is um, so the higher up the line is on the y-axis, the more uh, recovery there is. So basically, the, the plants recover. They were originally infected, but they're not infected. And so the, um, the, the, the rainfall is the two lines. You see the arrow? There's two lines, a green or a blue one. So the, the more rainfall there is, you see the lower we are on the recovery axis. So the more rainfall there is, the less recovery there is. But temperature, the orange and the red line is actually the opposite. And so the more temperature, the higher the temperature is in an area, the more likely it is that there is gonna be a recovery. This real temperature is, has not been emphasized enough. In fact, the effect of temperature is stronger than rainfall. It's about twice, twice, twice um, as much stronger than rainfall is. So really, as we move towards the warmer areas in California, really, we see a lot of negatives uh, because the temperatures get warmer. So there are two factors here that, that are um, together affecting the results. And then um, where will these results be published? They're going to be published on the Sod Blitz map first. Usually a week later, they show up on the Sod map. And now we also have them on the Kalinvasives map, which this is the Kalinvasives map, which you can see is very easy to read. Uh, in this case, we're actually showing the data in 10 kilometer squares, but you, you can look at point uh, data that you have 25,000, or you can look at smaller or smaller squares or larger cells, and you can look at all hosts, or you can look at Tanuk or just Bay Laurel, and then you can look at uh, any year uh, period you want. So it actually allows you to play quite a bit. Uh, with the data. And so we actually are committed to, and this is, this can be printed in a very, uh, in a way that actually shows, shows the distribution very clearly. Like in this case, it's, it's very simple to look at this map and see where Ramorum is present or it's not present. And um, I wanted to, um, there was a one more slide. No, I don't think so. Um, I'm done. And again, I am really thankful for all the local organizers. I think Chris helps organizing the, um, the uh, North Coast Blitz. Uh, the, we have about 20, um, actually we have about 40 local organizers and they've been really the heart of this activity. And I can tell you that we run this activity on less than $100,000, an activity that is one order of magnitude smaller in, in the UK uh, is run for about 2 million a year. So kudos to Doug that makes this happen with um, on a shoestring. And I will take questions if there are any. Thanks, Matteo. Um, yes, the first is from Janelle Hillman. And she would like to know, how do you think the CZU fire might have affected the high rate of infestation seen in Big Basin and near Big Basin and the Santa Cruz Mountains? The what? The? Uh, how did it infect? Oh, the fire. OK, OK, I got it. I got it. Well, you know, I'm not sure because to be honest, the Big Basin um, area is an area that doesn't have a lot of the major transmissive hosts. So we're kind of dancing around it. <laughs> we have one sample here, one sample there. True, every year we get a little bit closer, maybe because people are looking. The other results are, even without the fire, I see them as a natural consequence of the perfect conditions that the Western slopes of the Santa Cruz Mountains offer to Southern Ogdev. However, the history is interesting because the disease didn't come from the Western side. It came from the South and the Eastern side and then went up. And so from the ridge line, the disease is moving West. And that's why we're discovering these new outbreaks little by little. I'm not really sure that the fire had a role because if we look 
at the distribution next year, we find that nearby, in, in a stream nearby maybe, or, or, or a small watershed nearby, there was sudden death. And now we see it in another one that's not that far. So all I'm saying is, either it's moving, uh, you know, not particularly long distance, or we haven't looked there before. So I'm saying that that pattern is really indicative of very favorable conditions for the disease. Um, and um, I would say that the only area where, you know, obviously marine has been very favorable and big sur. So these are the areas where the disease really seems to be prevalent and, and definitely the, the, the top and the west side of the Santa Cruz mountains, especially in the middle portion, the southern portion have been extremely supportive of the disease on, on the infectious hosts, uh, Tanox and, and bay laurels. Okay, thanks, Mateo. And then Susan Frankel would like to know if the word recovery means that the pathogen is no longer present or is it just not causing disease? Our interpretation, if you read the paper, is actually that it's not present. So, and, and remember, we're not wor we're working on we we I think the um, from a long time ago in the Rizos lab, they have shown that bay laurels drop the leaves that are infected. Um, so what we think is happening is that these bay laurels, the hotter it gets, and uh, but this is based on large numbers. We really see that in, I think in 10 years, there's a 25% recovery of, of trees in the warmer areas. So I actually think they, they're, they're disease-free. It doesn't mean that they're not going to become infected again. That's a super interesting question and something that we, we need to test experimentally, you know, like, like it's been done for pitch canker. So once it's infected, does it, is, the, is the tree a little bit more resistant simply because it has a memory of that infection and, and it got rid of it or not? So actually the data shows, shows full recovery. So from, from prime positive to prime negative. Thanks, Mateo. And then I have one last question from me. Um, were the, do you know if the samples that were positive from Del Norte County were PCR positives or were they cultured? There were PCR positives, but very strong PCR positives. And also there were only two, right, out of all the ones that we received. So we used two different markers, two different assays. And in order to be positive, you need to be positive for both. So I would say that these are true positives. I mean, yes, I think they're true. You know, we're very conservative now. On, on, on this topic. So I would say the true positives, um, the samples arrived that were a little bit messy. So the culturing didn't work out. We tried the culturing, but we also think that we, we, it's, it's been published that in very dry years, culturing is not really the best way to identify Romorum. And that's why, you know, even the government has decided that DNA-based testing is really the final world in, ter in terms of determining whether a plant is infected or not. So the signal that we got from the leaves were very strong, let's put it that way. But culturing was not, but again, the samples are right, they were a little messy. Uh, so I can't say that this was a perfect delivery um, the salary of Bispo was a perfect delivery and they were all negative, so we'll feel very comfortable. Um, but it's to be expected when we have these dry periods to have samples that are PCR, PCR positive, but uh, culture negative. It's not unheard of. Okay, thanks, Mateo. Um, some very interesting results there. Um, we appreciate all that work that goes into the side blitz. Um, and so now we'll, we'll move along. Uh, the next update presenter will be Wolfgang Schweib Koppler um, from, and Wolfgang, you have to tell me if I get this right, the National Ornamentals Research Site at Dominican University of California, aka Norsduck. Did it's I get it right? Yeah, you're correct. <laughs> All right. Take uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, we sure can. Great. <clears throat> Okay, um, so thanks for having me. I just want to start with an announcement. 
Uh, Karen Saslo, our program manager at Nordstark for the last eight years, just retired with the end of August, and I took over her job. So uh, in the last one or two years, we had a lot of different projects uh, going on at Nordstark, and I will just go through some of them very quickly, but actually there's more coming out from our lab. Hopefully we have some uh, publication coming out pretty soon. Excuse me, can you can you make it full screen size, please? Is it not full screen? It's not, it's not no. Uh, sorry, sorry, Wolfgang. Thanks, Faith. Okay, it's full screen on my computer. Okay. It, is, it is advancing, it's just not quite full screen. Oh, really? Yeah, we're seeing, I think you want to swap the presenter view in the slideshow because we're seeing presenter view right now. Okay. Does it work now better? There you go. There you go. Okay, thank you. Sorry for that. <clears throat> anyway, so at Nostec, we use a lot of heat treatment to mitigate uh, supplies and soil, which was contaminated with Phytophthora romorum using steaming and solarization. And actually we offer a steaming uh, program for nurseries and other people interested to do so. Uh, our steaming master Vernon Hoffman takes our steamer out to uh, native plant nurseries, also bigger nurseries to steam pots which were infested with Phytophthora romorum, infested soil, or also potting mix, soil, and so on. Uh, some of the jobs were pretty big, as you can see here. Uh, in Northern California, he steamed several thousand pots. Most of them survived and could be reused. Um, but very often when we talk to uh, nursery managers about steaming potting mix, they are kind of concerned on the effects of steaming on their uh, quality of their soil. And they wanna, they wanna see if steaming has an effect on the microbial community present in the soil, you know, on the, on the good guys, on the bioactive microorganisms, or if it also has some effect on the, steam, on the soil chemistry. So we teamed up with Sharita Crandall, assistant professor at Penn State, to uh, look at some of these questions. We did some steaming of uh, this plot here at Nordstack. I hope you can see my cursor. And we took samples pre-steaming and then post-steaming, one day post-steaming, one month, two months, and five months post-steaming. We did some chemical analysis and using next uh, generation sequencing, we also looked at the microbial composition and here is just some examples. Uh, I put here the bacteria, but we have similar data also from fungi. And maybe not very surprising that with steaming, we kind of um, got rid of most of the microorganisms in the soil. We had just a rather slow, low number of bacteria surviving. Most of them were bacteria, so they were kind of endospore producing heat resistant bacteria. But then if you take samples, one month, two months, five months for steaming, you can see definitely there's recolonization taking place at the very end after five months, we had more than 700 different microbial strains again in the soil. So there's a change, but I mean, the microbial biodiversity can come back after a certain amount of time here on the right hand side, it's kind of more or less the same data, but just presented in different way. So the colors, the same colors show similar kind of microbial community, one day, one month, two months and five months past steaming. And definitely you can see this kind of interesting shift. They're still working a little bit on the fungal communities, but in general, I think there's a similar pattern. When we looked at the chemical analysis, we saw that there was a little bit kind of mineralization going on. So steaming had a certain effect on some nutrients, not on all of them. We looked at very many of them and some of them changed a little bit. And uh, it also depended where we took the samples because we took soil samples from the very top, like two uh, centimeters uh, soil depth, and then some from the very bottom, which was 25 
centimeters. And there were some kind of changes because with our steaming approach, the higher uh, laying areas get more temperature, higher temperatures for longer amount of time. So that's not really surprising that we see this kind of different uh, uh, results. And actually one of the next experiments would do to kind of use different steaming technology, different steam methods where using a manifold where we have different kind of uh, heat transmission within, within our soul plot. Um, I think uh, Chris D yesterday talked a little bit about this new uh, pest on California oaks, the Mediterranean oak borer, which in pests mainly valley oak, maybe also some other oaks in Napa, Sonoma and Lake County and the uh, Sacramento area. So later this uh, fall, we want to try out steaming and solarization to kind of uh, control uh, populations within this infested oak. So actually we want to <laughs> take down this huge oak and cut it in different kind of sizes, wood chips and bigger wood sizes and steam them and see if we can treat and kill the beetles inside the wood. Uh, we did a number of different more environmental monitoring programs with some grad students who did their master thesis with me. Uh, Frankie Kreitz went out to Marine County and took water samples from the ocean, but from different creeks, some kind of clearer water, some a little bit more kind of disturbed water, and looked at the biodiversity of uh, all my seeds in the water. Uh, she found quite a few different species. Uh, some of them are listed here. Many of them belong to Phytophthora clade 6, which is a clade with a lot of more riparian species, species which are maybe not very aggressive, not very pathogenic, but they like to hang out in water. So a lot of them were around here in Marine County. Some of them may be new to California or never found here before. Interesting, we also found some Phytopithiums, which is kind of a not very well uh, group of uh, microorganisms closely related to Phytophthora, and we don't know too much about their role in the natural environment. But definitely we can find them in our waters here in Marine County. Maybe one interesting thing is that Frankie tried to bait the omycetes using different uh, plant tissue as a bait. Uh, for example, California Bay Laurel, which normally we always use to bait Phytophthora ramorum. And they work to a certain degree, but for example, Manzanita and Rhododendron worked better. We were able to bait some species with Rhododendron and Manzanita, which we were not able to bait with, with uh, bay leaves. Manzanita, we know that from previous experiments uh, when we did some monitoring in different nurseries, Manzanita is really kind of a hotspot or a magnet for Phytophthora. Many different Phytophthora species can be found associated with the roots or leaves of Manzanita. And uh, I think uh, Matteo before also mentioned that uh, he also uh, within the kind of salt uh, project found Phytophthora ramorum on Manzanita. So we also did some work, some inoculation studies with a number of different Manzanita Actostaphylos species in our lab with a student, Party Gonko, who did her master thesis. And definitely she could induce symptoms uh, on manzanitas when she did inoculate them in the grow chamber. So with high kind of humidity levels and you know perfect temperature conditions. When she tried to inoculate uh, potted plants at our nursery, so kind of field conditions outside, she did not see any symptom development. So I think definitely manzanitas, at least theoretically, many species of them are susceptible to Phytophthora ramorum. But again, like what we see again and again at Norstac, uh, there have to be the right conditions, uh, temperature and uh, rainfall, humidity conditions, actually to see the symptoms developing on plants in the field. Uh, 
We also do some monitoring in different areas within Marin County on manzanitas and other chaparral plants to see if we can find Phytophthora ramorum. Many plants show symptoms, especially in the last three, four years, more and more symptomatic manzanitas. And some of the symptoms are quite similar to what we see when we inoculate the plants with Phytophthora ramorum in the grow chamber. So we don't always know what's going on out there in the field. We try to identify Phytophthoras and we get some positives uh, using Actia or other methods from the leaves, but it's really difficult to grow Phytophthoras out of manzanita leaves. So we just got, I think, Phytophthora ramorum out of Actostaphylos in that area once or twice. So we know it's kind of around, but maybe not super common. But we are continuing this kind of uh, monitoring. Another very kind of applied experiment, uh, which we just did in the last few months, was to see if uh, Phytophthora ramorum or other plant pathogens, which might be present on the surface of a nursery, you know, just maybe hanging out on a leaf on, on the gravel or the concrete, which is, you know, used as a surface in the nursery. And then we use different kinds of irrigation can this pathogen spread to potted plants which are, you know, uh, placed on a, a bench like one or two or three feet above the surface. So we did this very kind of simple experiments where we used fluorescence microsphere, which we kind of used to mimic the plant pathogens. So we added this uh, fluorescence microspheres. Uh, we put them in front of this kind of filter paper uh, on five different surfaces and used three different irrigation types. And then under a kind of a fluorescent lamp, we detected and counted the number of uh, splashes in different, you know, heights of the paper to, again, to mimic a possible splash of plant pathogens in a nursery. And the, you know, the, in, the results of this kind of very simple experiments are maybe interesting for the nursery industry because definitely we can see that both the surface and the irrigation type has an impact on the number of splashes which we can detect. So on concrete and this wheat barrier cloth, we have more water splash than on gravel or bare soil or a mud puddle. And also when we kind of compare hand watering with spray sprinkler and um, <clears throat> impact sprinkler, we can see that this kind of in the middle one, the spray sprinkler uh, ends up uh, in resulting much less water splash than the other watering system. So that's just something to take into account when you try to avoid, uh, you know, the transmission of plant pathogens from the surface of your nursery to potted plants. Uh, okay, now we are going back to our environmental monitoring. We are looking at all kinds of uh, plants and trees in Marine County. Matteo gave a nice presentation yesterday, what's happening with eucalyptus and acacia in the Bay Area with many trees dying or showing different kinds of symptoms. We looked mainly on California, California Bay Laurel, Umbellularia californica in Marine County. It's a native tree, of course, very important because it produces a lot of Phytophthora ramorum inoculum. So therefore it's very kind of essential for understanding the epidemiology of Southern Oak Death. And therefore I think it's important to know what's going on with California Bay Laurel because it's not getting affected by Southern Oak Death alone, but there's a lot of other diseases, other problems which we can see in the last few years on uh, the Bay Laurel. And we were surprised last winter to see a lot of the symptoms, which you can see here on the photos. So mainly leaf blight, which starts out on different parts of the tree. We didn't really see a pattern. We saw some symptoms uh, appearing more on the upper part of the canopy, some in the lower parts, some parts uh, kind of uh, branches then spreading to the whole uh, tree. 
And most trees after a certain amount of time at the end of the rainy seasons showed many, many symptoms pretty much on the whole plant. We didn't really see a difference between older trees, younger trees. We didn't really see symptoms on the trunk and we didn't look at the roots, we have to admit. We just focused mainly on the leaves. That was maybe an easy first step for us. Uh, so the symptoms are mainly expressed in winter and spring, not so much during summertime. And most of the trees where we saw the symptoms on were more in exposed warmer areas on a ridge or more on the edge of a forest. We didn't really see a lot of the symptoms in the canyons or the deeper forest where of course a lot of the bay laurels normally hang out and look quite happy. So we don't really know what's causing uh, the problem. I think I agree with Matteo's talk yesterday that it might be a complex interaction of a number of different microorganisms and maybe changing climatic or environmental conditions. However, what we see in a very consistent way on the symptomatic leaves is uh, this kind of conidia which are produced by species belonging to Cavatiella, maybe more than one species. We have some preliminary DNA sequence analysis results together with Susan Leffen from the CDFA lab in Sacramento. So there might be a few species of Cavatiella B associated with the symptom expression. We see a lot of this conidia produced during the rainy season, not so much now in summertime. Uh, we isolated Cabatiella consistently from these leaves from 23 locations. Uh, we also found some other uh, pathogens and endophytes like Aureopacidium, very common endophytes, some Epicoccum, some Diaforte, some Cladosporium, again, some fungi which are pretty common. Some of them are um, famous endophytes and can be really found in many wooden plants. So we don't really know how they interact and what might trigger maybe some of them to become a little bit more aggressive. Uh, so we will continue that. We are planning to do some inoculation study later this um, fall. We also want to look a little bit on the biology of Cappadella, just see the perfect, you know, temperature conditions, stuff like that, to get a little bit of a better idea of these new disease symptoms in Marine County. And yeah, that's the end of my story. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. That's a very wide variety of research indeed, and some really useful information. There are some good questions for you, but we're going to need to hold those until later. So hopefully, okay, no problem. Hopefully, we'll be able to get um, to those at that point. And I um, am going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, I'm going to update you on what's going on in Del Norte County. Um, let me know if you guys can't see that. Um, this talk um, is would normally be given by Yana Valakovic, who is our management committee co-chair for the task force. Um, she is presenting currently to the California Board of Forestry on a different topic. And so I'm going to give this to her. And what I'm going to be doing is really filling you in on the background, because what Mateo told us about new samples in Del Norte County, new positive samples, is completely new information, including new to me. And so um, this will give you the background of what's been going on up to that point. The Chris, point of we are not yet seeing your slides. Okay. Let me see what I can do about that. Thanks, Faith. Uh, there we go. Um, and can you see something now? Yeah, you're good. Yeah, we can see your slides. Yes. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so here's what some of the symptoms look like in Del Norte County when um, we identified it. This is, this is the second site in Del Norte where it was identified, as you'll see in a minute. Um, this site in particular had some pretty dramatic symptoms. Here's the timeline. Um, in July of 2019, as part of the sod blitz, um, samples were confirmed positive for P. remorum, and I'll show you where that site was in a minute. That was a site that um, was occupied by the North American one strain of P. remorum. 
We looked and looked and looked for it again in that same site and repeated sampling failed to detect it. Then in the late summer 2020, in a second location, we confirmed P. remorum, and um, shortly after that, they were confirmed to be uh, the EU1 strain. So we have two strains of this pathogen in Del Norte County, which is the 16th positive county in California. Um, <clears throat> in um, winter of 2020, we conducted a slow the spread treatment at the EU1 site, and I'll show you some pictures from that in a minute. And of this, and in this year, we did. Uh, the, uh, the sod blitz, and um, it was not detected by culturing, as you heard from Mateo, but it has been by PCR, um, apparently. Um, the stream monitoring effort also didn't detect it this year. Let's keep going. So the red dot on the bottom uh, here is the NA1 site that was found in 2019, and, and we haven't really been able to redetect that. The red dot at the top is the EU1 site from 2020. The highway going um, west to east there is Highway 199. The highway going north to south is Highway 101. And the EU1 site was found um, at the site of the road that sort of connects those two um, in a sort of bypass there. Um, you can see that it's at the edge of that green colored vegetation, which is basically the redwood belt. Um, this was the delimitation in the local site around the EU1 find um, in 2020. The red pins there are places where we um, found symptomatic material and um, either tried to culture it or submitted it to the lab. And um, really that area in the circle was the only place where we found positives at that point in 2020. Um, here's another look at the symptoms at the EU1 site the sprouts um, were really blasted. Um, and that is what that is consistent with what they have told us in Oregon about the EU1 um, strain of Phytophthora remorum when they find it there, that they see a lot of involvement in the sprouting material in the understory and a lot of uh, black stem cankers and um, petiole and mid vein cankers in that material. Also, a lot of ambrosia, uh, ambrosia beetle activity, as you can see on the picture to the right there. Um, these are some more pictures. Um, it, you can see that although the vegetation was very involved in that EU1 spot that was invested, uh, you could really only see it if you were going um, by on the highway from this one direction. And even then, it was a little bit hidden by the other vegetation. Um, but once you got into the stand, as I said, the understory really had a lot of symptoms. Um, the team from um, the Agricultural Research Service in Oregon, led by Nick Grunewald, um, did a little bit of further follow-up genotyping work with the EU1 strains and compared them to, um, to isolates from nurseries and forests up and down the West Coast and found that they clustered most closely with the forest populations from Curry County. So it's consistent with a hypothetical scenario where that Del Norte invasion may have come from that Curry County forest established population, but there's no way to prove that. Um, we also looked at looked from the air after we detected this site, um, we looked um, up and down that redwood belt, especially in Del Norte County, um, for other signs of tan oak mortality, and we really didn't find much of anything at all. Um, this is an aerial view of that sudden oak death treatment area, that long, thin, curvy sliver along the road. The infestation was somewhere close to the middle of that uh, curved area and kind of uh, hanging right over the road. Um, and so our treatment involved cutting trees that um, were going to fall into the roadway when they died. And um, the primary treatment being to, because this was on private property and, and we uh, worked with the landowner closely to, uh, to get this treatment on the ground um, it was a, a treatment where tan oaks in the stand in a pretty wide buffer zone around that infestation were treated with herbicides to kill them in place. Um, and then those ones that would fall in the roadway um, 
were cut um, so that there wouldn't be a hazard. It was a pretty big endeavor and it came together in um, a, a, a pretty fast time frame um, in order to get that treatment done before the rainy season really set in. Um, and here are some pictures of that treatment. Caltrans was instrumental in working with the private landowner to mitigate that hazard risk to the road. It did involve closing the roadway down for a period of time and disposal of the material was affected by um, means of an air curtain burner, which you can see to the right. And also some material had to be chipped and those chips were removed to a biomass facility um, and used for energy production. And that was done in the, in the early um, fall um, period, um, mid fall period um, of 2020. Um, so in 2021, we have been monitoring with stream sampling with the sod blitz, as you've heard, and you can see that no P. remorum detected. That's going to have to change, obviously, because it was detected and we're going to have to be working with Mateo's lab to figure out which samples um, were uh, confirmed positive through PCR. It has been a strange year for sampling P. remorum. None of the samples that we collected in Del Norte County really looked like very strong symptoms to us. And so we sent in whatever we could find, fully expecting that none of them really were gonna turn out positive. Um, a similar thing actually happened in the sod blitz in Mendocino County, where we were pretty sure we identified um, a new satellite infestation to the very Eastern part of Jackson Demonstration State Forest. Um, lots of dead tan oaks um, aligning a waterway where we hadn't detected it before. It looked very strongly like P. remorum, but it doesn't look like those turned out positive. Um, and so, as Mateo mentioned, um, the, the connection between symptoms and lab detection this year um, is particularly fraught. Um, we've also been doing an enhanced parks and trail survey throughout Del Norte County. And we've recovered a lot of other fungi, uh, but no P. remorum from, from that sampling effort yet. Um, the very last item that I'm going to say before we move on is that USDA and California Department of Food and Ag quarantines were put in place for Del Norte County. Um, the California Board of Forestry Zone of Infestation, which pertains to commercial forestry timber harvest activities, um, we're still discussing what that zone is going to be because some stakeholders express an interest in that zone of infestation being smaller than the entire county, especially since we've engaged in active management efforts there to try to slow the spread. Uh, and that should be all for me. And we'll hold questions and I'll stop. Sharing. Chris, I need to go, but I feel that I should say something because first of all, you, you failed to mention the UC Berkeley was the lab that first determined that there was any one uh, about 24 hours before Nick Grunwald did. And that's, that should not be forgotten. And that was also part of the sublet. Yes. Um, so yeah, so that's important. Also, the, I, should, I should point out that the 2019 finding, we still have two cultures from two different trees and those were NA1. So that was a culture-based identification. And I should point that the reason why we have uh, DNA-based testing is because culturing is, doesn't work as well as DNA testing. So we should be careful. We should not say, oh, if it's a DNA-based testing, we, we're not gonna, you know, we're not, we're not gonna trust it because then why do the governments of the entire world use DNA testing? Oh, rather yeah. than culture? I have absolutely yeah. no intention of suggesting that at all. I have no doubt. No, but there's a certain undertone. So I wanted to make sure that people that are not experts I was the, the person that actually designed the first DNA test in the world for a pathogen that's regulated. And um, I would say almost every country in the world uh, has adopted that approach. So it doesn't have regulatory value in this case because it wasn't taken by a regulatory agency, but it, it, in a dry season. And the last point I wanted to make was Salmon Creek, we have at least 20 positives, yet the water was negative. Marine County was negative for Ramoro. Right. I didn't see I didn't see Ramorum in Marine County, which is obviously something is going on with the water baiting. Because if Marine County doesn't show Ramorum, there is a, there's something going on. 
Yeah, yeah I, would, I would say your PCR detection at, in this year is a very strong argument for the sensitivity of that assay. So I'm sorry if I implied that um, it was somehow weaker than a culture positive. That's not what I meant to imply. Um, no, no, I, I, don't, I just wanted to clarify. I don't, I don't know the way you feel. I just no. wanted to clarify for people, that especially when you have two results from two different trees. If you only have one, normally you always think false positive. But when you have two, that makes the detection a lot more, more comfortable, uh, especially if you use two different assays that both and, come out positive. The symptoms from that first site were so strong that I didn't much doubt that it was P. remorum. What has me scratching my head is why we haven't detected it in that same spot again. Right. No, I agree. Um, it's in here, but we have those two cultures from two different trees, and you know, you collected those, so yeah. we were not able to uh, yeah. to get any more. But it was yeah. there at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on now to um, the South to um, the an update from the uh, CSU uh, from the Cal Poly San Luis Obispo lab headed by Richard Cobb. And um, Richard, are you there and ready to talk to us about what you guys have been doing? I am. Hello. And this never happens, but I was having internet problems. I fixed it right before uh, was my time to go. So I will be brief just in case they return. Um, but uh, thanks everyone, really interesting talks. We are working on issues related to uh, basically three aspects of wildland, uh, issues of sudden oak death in wildlands. And I will talk about those. What we have been doing in the last year is focusing on an assessment of Dolan, uh, the impacts of the Dolan fire. I will speak more about that in just a second. We've also been working to revisit our uh, analysis that was published last year, uh, uh, estimating the number of infected trees and dead and trees killed by sudden oak death. That was a, a really um, uh, helpful kind of thing to finally get out. Uh, but those numbers are current as of about 2010, probably even more realistically, even a little bit earlier than that, 2008. So we immediately started working on the next thing. Okay, so what have we been up to? Well, we're trying to uh, look at or determine if interactions between fire and sudden oak death occurred. There was a question about the CZU. Um, and although we're not working on that fire, we are working in Big Sur, which has been impacted by multiple fires. And of course, this network was set up by Dave Rizzo and Ross Mentemeyer, and I was Dave's student, so I'm continuing to work on it. Um, and Cal Poly students are working with UC Davis, and it's a close collaboration. Uh, so really kind of the thing for the broader community to, to know, what I would like you to know, is that we're our network has, our plot network has burned so many times that as Allison Similar Williams puts it, we're really starting to study fire regimes and how they may or may not interact with sudden oak death. So I don't, I'm not going to show you any results right now because frankly, we're still in the field uh, trying, trying to acquire those critical data. But uh, what we aim to do in the future is ask, you know, how. Uh, what are the effects of repeated fire? What, is the re what are the effects of, of, um, of two fires in areas with sudden oak death? How does that affect the disease? How does uh, the disease affect fire? And um, since we've been working on this for about 15 years now, um, we are able to examine different intervals of fire and, as I say, different numbers of fire frequency. So this is kind of how things look at this point. Three fires in our plot network, about um, more than half of it is burned. We have lots of replication, always have uh, at least 10, about 10 replicates, replicate plots and various forest types and other kinds of, of conditions, um, such as, you know, numbers of fire. Uh, the big thing that my lab, um, in addition to this, the big thing that uh, my lab did in, in conjunction with Dave and especially Carrie is to expand our portfolio of management experiments. So um, we kicked off a, a set of 
field experiments at the SoCal State Demonstration Forest this summer. And um, just kind of by chance, Phil Cannon was uh, out in the field and um, got to come out and look at what we're doing. And this is just a picture of Phil, Gary Frangioso, and Angela Bernheisel, who directs that forest. Um, this is uh, an effort to replicate stand level management aimed at controlling sudden oak death. The other sites that are part of this are uh, Humboldt, in Humboldt County, Lax Creek, that's pre-disease, hasn't really had disease emergence there yet, um, not in the areas where we did management. Uh, at the Marin, Marin Municipal Water District, which is very highly impacted, and then in SoCal, which has not burned but is um, sudden oak death impacted. And then uh, we have some analysis with some advances, and I have just one message for you, just one message in terms of results. And that's an analysis done by a Cal Poly undergraduate, Gisela Quiroga. Uh, she undertook this last year, looking at our data collected over the last six years in Humboldt and Marin to ask how do sudden oak death management treatments affect characteristics that might lead or lead to um, increased fire impacts. Uh, this kind of analysis also informs how uh, the epidemiology uh, of the pathogen in stands. Gisela was interested in fire and she focused on that. So the main, the, the main message here is in terms of mitigating some of the fuels problems that arise because of mortality with sudden oak death, there's a very simple message. And that is doing something is better than doing nothing. So we uh, compared several different kinds of mastication piles with or without burning. Uh, and basically what we found is that everything works. Uh, you can reduce densities, you can get rid of dead fuels, um, there's some variation, you know, in, in the efficacy, uh, depending on what you're interested in, especially mastication is really good at getting rid of stuff that's on the forest floor. But essentially, everything is working. And the good news is that this comes at a fairly low cost in terms of removing live biomass. And the reason for that is because sudden oak death causes prolific resprouting, um, especially in Marin County. One of our biggest problems there from a forest management perspective is not dead fuels, it's the re-sprouting fuels. And there's one more message to, to share with you about that. And that's that uh, re-sprouting is, um, re is, is, uh, is a problem in areas that are highly impacted. And it may reduce the durability uh, of not, if we, when, if, if you do not follow up and control re-sprouting, may reduce the durability of those treatments. So treatments are, are expensive, especially in areas that are highly disease impacted. It, it is very difficult to work in them. And uh, it will probably wor be worthwhile for managers to consider before they start to ask the question, how are you gonna maintain these treatments? What are you gonna do for follow-up? Are you gonna have to plant or even go back and remove sprouts? And that's what you're seeing here. If you don't remove sprouts, you start to see an increase in densities. And also, uh, importantly, you see a difference in the quadratic mean diameter. That is a measure of stand structure. OK, and we will continue working on this, evaluating these treatments, and trying to get updated estimates of disease, disease impacts for the entire region uh, over time. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's all I've got for you. Thank you so much, Richard. That's great information. And we look forward to seeing what else comes out of it. Our next presentation is um, a nursery presentation. Um, Carolyn Lambert from the California Department of Food and Agriculture is going to present to us. Carolyn, are you there and ready to go? Hey, this is Christina Weber with CDFA. Um, Carolyn Hi. texted me and she's having a computer issues, so I don't know if she's able to get back on yet. Okay, well, um, what we could do if, um, if Janelle is ready to talk, um, we could um, switch those talks out and hopefully Carolyn will be able to get that difficulty ironed out. Um, Janelle, do you think that uh, 
you might be ready to give us a little update on the Phytophthora's and Native Habitats work group. Sure, I can do that. Thank you so much. Hey everyone, um, good afternoon. I'm going to highlight the past year's accomplishments of the Phytophthora and Native Habitats Working Group, and we focus on non piramorum Phytophthora. So first, uh, Mia Angolia of SFPUC has joined our other co-leads of the Calphytos Working Group. So um, she joins Diana Benner at the Watershed Nursery, Janice Alexander, UC Cooperative Extension, Elisa Shore at Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, Susan Frankel at the US Forest Service, and myself at Santa Clara Valley Water District. So we have a great interdisciplinary team of co-leads for this collaborative working group. And we're very excited to report that in February of 2021, our group was awarded the 2020 IPM Achievement Award from the California Department of Pesticide Regulation. And this is an annual award that recognizes California organizations that use integrated pest management to address um, diverse pest management problems in the state of California. And just a short summary from the um, CDPR press release, through extensive research and effective outreach efforts to share its practices, the Phytophthoras and Native Habitats Work Group has made commendable progress in minimizing the spread of Phytophthoras. And this includes best management practices for managing Phytophthoras in nursery settings to halt the spread of these Phytophthoras into natural areas. Um, next, I'll give an update on our accreditation to improve restoration or the AIR um, progress and plans. This is a program, the AIR program, um, that implements the systematic use of native plant BMPs that are designed to exclude Phytophthoras in native nursery plants in California. So we're pleased to report that the AIR program will be housed at um, the UC Davis Department of Plant Pathology. And the program will have a link on the department homepage. So we're currently working to improve the AIR website and it will appear at that link. The Northern California AIR program continues. We currently have about a dozen nurseries participating in this pilot program. And special thanks to Ted, Diana, and Joanna Del Castillo for all this work that they've done um, in the pilot program in Northern California. The Southern California Air Program is supported by a National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant. And Billy Sale at Rancho Santa Ana Botanical Garden has set up a restoration phytophthora lab for Southern California. And so far, three nurseries have completed the program and have all met the best management practices and all have tested negative for Phytophthora pathogens. And again, this is also um, a program to prevent pathogen introduction into wildlands. And we have about 12 nurseries signed up for the Southern California program and are, um, are expected to complete the process in the next few months. We also have a series of new publications that have come out in the past year. And these are collaborative publications by um, authors that are active in our working group. So the first one was published in Plant Health Progress and the title is An Accreditation Program to Produce Native Plant Nursery Stock Free of Phytophthora for Use in Habitat Restoration. And this paper presents um, the success of the BMPs that we've presented that actually are working quite well to exclude Phytophthora um, in nurseries. So I'm just gonna read the main takeaway from this paper. In 564 tests conducted over four years with a sensitive leachate baiting protocol, no Phytophthora was detected from over 20,000 nursery plants produced in compliance with the BMPs. In comparison, Phytophthora was detected in 25% of tests conducted on partially compliant stock and in 71% of tests from nurseries following few or no BMPs. And special thanks to Ted Swicky and Liz um, Bernhardt for their work on this. We had another publication um, that was published in a special issue of Phytophthora management in the journal Forests. 
And the title of that publication is Phytophthora Plant, Phytophthora Pathogen Introductions in California Restoration Areas, Protecting California Native Flora from Human-Assisted Pathogen Spread. And then a third publication appeared in the US Forest Service publication called The Cross Pollinator. And this is an article about our work, working group efforts and it presents a series of case studies as well. And the title of that article is A Threat to Ecological Investments, Plant Pathogens in Land Landscape Restoration Projects. And if anyone is interested in any of these publications, please let me know and I'd be happy to send you links to them. So I'll just end with an announcement that tomorrow our Cal Fido's working group is hosting a two hour discussion, which is part of these California Oak Mortality Task Force um, three day annual meeting of presentations. And we're very excited to have the time from one to 3 p.m. tomorrow um, to talk about a whole series of topics. So we hope you'll join us. Just to let you know what we plan to cover tomorrow, um, we'll start with some management and research prog progress, which will present both case studies and management practices, as well as a new heat treatment alternative for contaminated field and nursery sites, as well as an update on Phytophthora detections in nurseries. We'll have a round robin um, portion of the meeting where we'll talk about BMT, BMP updates, nursery testing, um, what's working in the field practically and what, what hasn't. And we'll also discuss a series of proposals and issues. And one of the new things we're thinking about um, is a proposal for a restoration plant health program at UC Davis. And that's still in the early stages, but we're quite excited about the potential for that. We'll also discuss some wildland introductions that occur from non-planting activities such as biking, horses, and ATVs. And the meeting is tomorrow from one to three. And as far as I know, we'll be at the same Zoom link. So hope that you can all join us. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Janelle. And um, congratulations to the working group for the award, which is well-deserved. Um, and um, yeah, everybody, if you can tune in to tomorrow's meeting um, to um, explore those topics. And our final update will come from Carolyn, and hopefully Carolyn um, was able to overcome her technical issues and is uh, ready to update us on um, nursery issues. I am. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> my Zoom kept shutting down and I had to restart my computer, so I'm back. Thanks. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Yep, there it is. All right, so my update today is um, from the nurseries in California. Um, you already talked about uh, Del Norte is the 16th county uh, to be designated as infested and quarantined in California. There are no regulated establishments up there. Uh, their lily bulb industry was unaffected and they are shipping with um, phytosanitary certificates. Uh, the group that I work with, we're federal and uh, state officials, and we work to update um, and, and add important um, new protocols to the USDA Piro Mora Manual. And what we've been working on is the addition of an independent site assessment tool. Um, it's basically uh, best management practices like sanitation and physical separation of sites um, in order for a positive nursery to have an area considered clean within, um, within that site. The group is also working on the revision of a retail confirmed nursery protocol. Right now in California, there are 288 um, establishments like nurseries, green waste, um, tree farms that have compliance agreements. All of these establishments receive some kind of inspection, usually more than one per year. Right now we have eight nurseries in California that were positive in the last three years. 
and they undergo an enhanced inspection. It's biannual and we collect around 300 samples uh, twice a year at each of these nurseries. So by year, you can see uh, this year we've had three positive nurseries. Uh, the spike was between 2017 and 2019. Our lab processed uh, around 6,800 samples, 22 were positive. Uh, from the three positive nurseries in 2021, um, we, during our trace forward and back uh, inspections, uh, there were no positive samples, which is good. Carolyn, I can't hear you anymore. I'm not sure about others. Sounds as if her problems have returned. Wow. It, oh, it could be that her um, system froze up again. Christina, do you have anything, um, do you know um, anything else that Carolyn really wanted to be sure was addressed in her update? Um, I don't know. I, let me see, let me look at her presentation. I have to dig out a copy real quick. Thanks for thanks for your help. Um, yeah. While we're uh, waiting, uh, and we only have a few minutes left, and of course we want to respect everybody's time, but there were some questions um, that we weren't able to get to, particularly um, directed at Wolfgang's presentation. So I'll ask you one of those right now, Wolfgang, which is. Um, uh, does the recolonization by soil microorganisms occur when the soil is kept in pots or how is the soil stored that was recolonized? Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, that was a good question. <clears throat> Actually, what we did, we kind of steamed uh, the soil at our nursery and it was kind of covered with our tarp as usual. After steaming, when the temperature you know, was again at ambient temperatures, we removed the tarp and just kept the soil there. So pretty much it was kind of open. And we think that most of the recolonization came from outside. We did it in this way because we wanted to have it as applied and similar to a real situation in a nursery as possible. I think in many of the small nurseries, they might get uh, a potting mix they might treat it and then they just put the potting mix in kind of a, a corner for a few weeks, a few months to they kind of use it up. And that's how we did it. Thanks, Wolfgang. Christina, um, have you come up with anything else that uh, we need to be updated on? Yeah, I was just texting Carolyn while she was working on trying to get back on, and it's saying gotcha. that she's getting an error. Um, I got kicked out once as well, so okay. I don't know what's going on. But I think she got to the slide about 2021 trace investigations, correct? Mm -hmm. Before before everyone stopped trying, stopped being able to hear. Mm -hmm. um, she said that if everyone heard that, that was pretty much all of it. The next slide was her closing slide, so. Okay, thanks yeah. so much. Thanks both to you and to Carolyn um, for that update. And I'm sorry about the technical problems. Um, and, um, you know, that's the Zoom world that we live in. Um, Janice, do you have anything to tell us um, 
before we close about tomorrow's meeting. I wanted to thank everybody for attending this executive committee meeting. Um, your input was much appreciated. Yeah, I did that. Thank you for everyone for the speakers and for the participants and all your questions. And again, my apologies for the back and forth with different Zoom links. Um, <clears throat> I would say the safest bet is just, just to check your email again tomorrow afternoon with whatever link seems to be working. They keep on changing things up on me, keep me on my toes. So I will send you whatever link is working for the meeting tomorrow. Everyone who is on the registration list should get that email and we will be starting at 1 p.m. again. Again, tomorrow's meeting will go a little bit longer. So 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific. Thanks again, everyone. Have a good afternoon.